Hello and welcome back to the KZZ channel. I'm Rob and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Today we continue with the compilation videos which are aimed at people who are working or people who are driving or people who just have a heck of a lot of time and want something on in the background. Today's compilation is our last five entitled parents videos. Let's jump right in. Our first story today comes to us from Brandy Aiden Love. Entitled mother and entitled grandmother tried to kill residents of a group home. Let's jump right in. Reading the post about someone else's experience in a group home setting reminded me about this. It was a lot more traumatic than it sounds and I don't talk about it much. Sorry it got so long. Many years ago I worked in a group home. For the privacy of all the residents, we had a set visitation room with visitation hours by appointment only appointment only so that two families weren't trying to visit at the same time. It had a separate entrance and a door that shut it off from the rest of the house. It had a half bath, a TV, cable hookup, game console, maybe 50 games, DVD player, and about 150 movies, board and card games, along with nice comfy seating and a small four-person table. Visitors were not allowed anywhere but that room if any of the other residents were home. It didn't matter if Bill wanted to show off his new bedding set or if Jack's mom wanted to see if he needed new clothes. If the other residents were home, no. The families of five of the residents were fine with it. Kyle's mother and grandmother were not. They firmly believed they were within their rights to enter the rest of the house and inspect it and his housemates. He was their baby and they had rights by God. Actually, no. The residents of this home were 30 to 40 year old men with developmental and physical disabilities. They were all actually wards of the state. The fact they were even allowed to know where he was, let alone visit, was a huge privilege. Our agency had many other homes where families of the residents had no idea where they were and weren't allowed to see them. The families were only allowed to contact the case manager and inquire about them. Back to Kyle's mom and grandma. It was a constant battle to keep them out of the rest of the house. It got to the point that we had to have an extra staff member during their visits. They had to sit outside the connection door while the visits were going on and physically stand blocking their way when they would attempt to enter. I lost track of how many times we ended up calling the police to have them removed from the main part of the house before that happened. That's when they started calling the police on us. After the third time of them calling the police to demand entrance to the rest of the house, they lost their privilege of visiting. Kyle was moved to another home where they weren't allowed to know the address. This didn't go over well to put it nicely. They were adamant Kyle was still in our home and they threatened us several times that we would pay for keeping their baby from them. A restraining order was granted against them, keeping them 800 feet from the house staff, residents, and no calls to the house. It all came to a head one night when at dark 30, I was locking up the house for the night. All doors and windows had to be checked and the alarm set. Another staff was doing bedtime medicine. The other two were helping out with bedtime routines and getting laundry going. I kept telling the other staff I smelled smoke, like a campfire, just faint whiffs of it. They said I was crazy. I had just walked the entire house and nothing was burning. It must be a neighbor having a small backyard fire or something, and I got a whiff while closing the windows, and it was stuck in my nose. It finally was strong enough for the others to smell. In pairs, we checked the house again. Nothing, but the smell is getting stronger. We met back in the living room and decided to go ahead and call the fire department when we realized we could see wisps of smoke in the living room. We woke the residents and had them put on shoes and jackets. The smoke in the living room was now clearly visible and starting to make its way toward the bedrooms and it triggered the alarms. Finally. Protocol was to evacuate and get the residents to the van. The living room was the exact center of the house with an open floor plan with the kitchen one side and a laundry room on the other. The bedrooms were through the living room and to the left and right along with the two bathrooms, the visitor's room and our office being at opposite ends of each other. Down the hall we shuffled to our office because the van was parked to that side and the keys in the office. As we came around the corner of the house, we see the source of the smoke. Our front porch was on fire. The house was brick which was what was preventing it from spreading outward but it was spreading upwards towards the roof. The police and fire departments arrived just as we reached the van. Fire department went to work on the house, police head towards us. 
We are all fine, except four people came running up to us. Kyle's mother and grandmother, along with two unknown men. The two women started screaming for Kyle, and they were here to rescue him. We had endangered him by allowing him to live in a fire trap. They suddenly realized there was no Kyle in the group, and were now screaming that we had left him to burn in that house. They were suing us, they would shut us down, and have us in prison for murder. The police quickly asked if we had left someone behind, to which we answered no. We have all six men, but for their safety, we had to get them in the van, and then we would sort this out. The police held mother and grandmother back from us, while they continued to shriek about Kyle, and we had left him to die. Two of the staff loaded them while me and my coworker talked to the police, starting with the fact those two women had a restraining order, and for his safety and ours, Kyle had been moved to a location unknown to them. They were cuffed immediately and told to pipe down. We proceeded to explain what had transpired that evening. The fire was doused quickly while we did this. One of the firemen came over to talk to the officers, and we heard him say there was preliminary evidence this fire was set deliberately. There would be a formal investigation. Kyle's mother and grandmother were arrested for violating the restraining order and suspicion of arson. The two men were arrested on suspicion of arson also. Results from the investigation determined clear case of arson. There was also a deliberate rigging of a device to the door leading out of the visitation room that would have been fatal to the person opening the door and if anyone was close by, debilitating if not fatal. The four were indicted on vandalism, arson, eight counts of attempted homicide, two counts of attempted murder. It came out that they were unaware of the other side door which saved lives. They got a plea deal and got 7 to 10 years each. This was back in the early 2000s, so I don't remember what exactly the sentence was. So if I'm reading this correctly, they were going to burn their precious Kyle alive because they thought there was only one way out and they booby-trapped the way out? What the heck is up with that? There was a great quote down in the comments for this one that says, All kids deserve parents, but not all parents deserve kids. That definitely holds true, regardless of whether they're kids or adult children. And it sounds to me like Kyle is definitely better off being a ward of the state. Do me a quick favor, have a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're not actually subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our next story today comes to us from Angelic Beauty 112 Entitled mother abuses and manipulates me for control over my finances. Let's jump right in. I'm writing this at midnight on a complete impulse. This is my entire life's worth of emotion, so it may be long and go on tangents a fair bit. As far as I know, it may not even be fitting here, but she thinks she's entitled to everything in my life. I need to get at least this story out. Backstory. My mother, 52, and I, female 18, have never gotten on properly. My dad, 55, works most of the time, and even when he's at home, he's in his office. So I spent most of my childhood, if not all, around my mother. We've never been on the same page about a lot of things. She's quite homophobic, transphobic, racist, basically any hatred against others you can think of, she's it. Meanwhile, I'm a trans girl who believes in complete equality, which means she and I have clashed over everything, from pride to ALM. I don't back down, even though we'll be at odds for days, and I just leave it until she apologizes. She's never changed her views, mind you. She just ignores any attempts to explain something I make and sticks to her guns. But at least it keeps the peace. She's highly manipulative and controls everything in my life through pure abuse. This is a very mild example, but I've been looking to try growing my hair out for a while just to see if it helped with my gender identity. My dad's completely cool with it because he thinks I'm just trying it out for fun. But my mom has become seriously nasty when I put the idea forward because it looks effing revolting. I mention anything about letting it grow and she gaslights and manipulates me into getting it cut. Her actual technique changes every time, from straight up screaming abuse to days of ignoring me and even the I don't know what you're talking about card and an attempt to keep the peace and keep myself safe I give in every time. Also, I've tried coming out to her as transgender numerous times now. Every single time, she just told me that I'm a confused boy who made up a stupid fantasy, has told me that she will never respect such a ridiculous request. 
and if I want to keep any kind of relationship with my family, I need to grow the F up. Since the last incident a year ago, I basically have shut her off in that regard. I'm open with my friends about my identity and happily go by my preferred name and pronouns when I'm living at my uni apartment during the week, but have to do everything possible to keep this life hidden from her. That even meant buying some feminine clothes and having them delivered to my unit and telling her that the bill was for some video game equipment. I'll explain that later. Story. When my 18th birthday was approaching, I found out that my bank accounts would be severed from my parents and made my own. They would no longer be able to access them without my permission, which requires formal setup with my bank. I let her know about that change, my first big mistake. And my mother says, Okay, so when can we get permission to access your accounts? I don't really think I want to do that. Why not? I'll be an adult, and I want to try and be more independent. If you need access in an emergency, I'll obviously give it to you. She's starting to get angry. No, I need access to your accounts. What? Why? If you don't give me access, you're not getting paid. For context, I do regular jobs around the house so my parents don't need to hire anybody. I only get about $10 a week, but it's cheaper than hiring and I have no issue doing the work. I'm a neat freak anyway. Basically, she refused to just have the account details and started a week-long fight about getting unlimited access to all of my accounts. Her biggest swipe was, only days before my birthday, transferring every dollar I had, savings, work pays, etc. into her own account and threatening to keep it unless I gave her access once I turned 18. Those were a few thousand Australian dollars in those accounts, and I'm ashamed to admit that I gave in. About two weeks after my 18th, I signed a contract with my bank to give my mother access permissions. The first thing she does when we get home from that trip is go back through my account and interrogate me about my spending of a grand total of $40 on non-essentials in the past two weeks. I'm not ashamed to admit that $10 had gone towards some adult material, but thankfully, the billing address was pretty non-specific, so I just said it was for some filmmaking assets. I do not want to see a single dollar going out of any of those accounts again, or I will hide your money again. Since then, I've had to move for university. She told me, not suggested that we try it, but told me it would be like this, that I'd be commuting three hours each way, six hours total every weekday. My dad stepped in and managed to get her to see reason somehow, so during the week, I have a partial break. She rings me every single night for a report on the day, including where I went, who I saw, and what I spent any money on that I didn't check with her first. Trigger warning, depression, and suicide mention. But the last straw was a few months ago when my depression took a really bad spike one night. I've had that and anxiety since late primary school, and in the past few years, it's gotten so much worse. I had brief counseling in 2019 after begging my parents for years to let me see a psychologist and being told I was just being stupid. But that was it. I was so low and lonely, I tried to talk to her about something that was on my mind, and her response? For God's sake, just shut up. You have it better than I ever did growing up. Be thankful. She had a pretty abusive family growing up too, so I'm wondering if the chain of abuse played a big part in this. So I wanted to end things, and was preparing to make another attempt using every pill I could find. Out of nowhere, my mother comes swinging at me and hitting me, and eventually forces me to drop everything I was holding. I broke down and just told her about how I was feeling, about the sadness and loneliness, and how I just wanted it all to end. I told her about my previous attempts too. Are you seriously this pathetic? This is just an attention-seeking move, and if you don't get an effing grip, I will drive you straight to a mental asylum. And believe me, you won't survive a night there. She used to be a mental health nurse. How ironic. That was it. I realized my mother was toxic and spiteful, and that I would never be able to tell her anything or live my own life while she's around. I'm not going to write anymore because this is getting way too long and tangential already, but what I've explained in this post is one-eighth of all the stuff she's done. I can't actually even begin to word some of the things she said to me and made me feel, and I've blocked some of it out because it just makes me cry to think back on it. But since that incident, I've been secretly planning things out so I can move and become independent permanently. All I'd need to do is cut off her financial access when I have the money. Also, a reason I haven't revoked her access to my accounts is because one of her many threats that she's made 
and one of the few she's followed up on is to kick me out. In high school, I ended up sleeping in an empty house towns over because I wanted to wear something she didn't particularly like, and I know very well that I could end up homeless if I stand up to her now. My best friends are all a long way away for university or travel, and I don't have enough money right now to secure any kind of stable living yet. Anyway, yeah, I'm sorry for making this so long and pathetic, and it probably isn't even that bad. I just need to get this all out, so thanks for reading. Okay, number one OP, don't mention a single darn thing about moving out to your mom. I just start getting things ready and move anything valuable to your uni dorm. Number two, check with your uni and see if they have any mental health services. They can't tell your parents because you're 18. They might even be able to put you in touch with the right people for financial help until you can get a job and get up on your feet on your own. The last suggestion is to check out r slash raised by narcissists because you might find some people there in the same situation who can help you through this time. This story fits the same quote from the last story by the way, all kids deserve parents, but not all parents deserve kids. Our next story today comes to us from Time Caterpillar 24 Entitled mother-in-law demands a paternity test and then tries to kidnap the baby. Let's jump right in. This is my sister's story. Please excuse the language. English is not my first language. My sister and her husband were together for five years before they got married in 2016. Within a month of their marriage, my sister found out she was expecting. She told very few people around her, her mother-in-law was not one of them. When she was 12 weeks along, she finally felt secure enough to announce her pregnancy to everyone else. Entitled Instance 1 Entitled mother-in-law started crying, and everyone around her was celebrating. My sister announced it during a family lunch between our families. The only ones who knew were me, my parents, and her husband, my brother-in-law. My sister's in-laws and brother-in-law's siblings were just finding out. My sister had not wanted to share the news because she was worried about miscarrying. However, when her mother-in-law saw my parents and me smiling and not being surprised, she started bawling, screaming that my sister ruined her experience of finding out about her grandbaby by not telling her as soon as she found out. She was angry about the fact that my sister shared the news with us, her literal flesh and blood over her father-in-law had to remove her from the situation, and my sister felt guilty as did my brother-in-law. They spent the rest of the afternoon trying to make up for it while the rest of us were confused why mother-in-law thought she deserved to know first. This leads to another situation, entitled Instance 2. Now, since mother-in-law felt excluded, she made sure she was included from that point onwards, throwing a baby shower much before my sister wanted to, decor and arrangements, guest list, and invites being done without as much as consultation from my sister, inviting mostly mother-in-law's side of the family and not ours, forcing my sister to let her be present for each prenatal checkup and scan. Moving into the house with my sister and brother-in-law to help take care of her baby, trying to control what and how much my sister eats, including throwing out essential medication prescribed to her and arguing against my sister's nutritionist who had made a very extensive meal plan for her. Finally, brother-in-law and sister had enough. They asked her to move out and not stick her nose into everything that was not her concern. Now, mind you, my brother-in-law is a big softy and a mama's boy, but he will stand up for his wife. This led to the penultimate situation entitled Instance 3. Mother-in-law lost her crap. How could her baby boy throw her out of the house? She decided it must be because my sister is a manipulative bee. Somehow, this string of thought landed her to presume that the baby could not be my brother-in-law's because brother-in-law wanted to wait until marriage to have sex and that my sister got pregnant too soon. So mother-in-law went around spreading gossip and rumor everywhere and to anyone stupid enough to listen to her, she went from calling my sister's unborn baby the her baby to now calling it every name possible. Devil child, the result of cheating, bastard and whatnot. Then she started demanding she needed to see proof of paternity, otherwise she would cut the child and my sister off from the family and also never speak to her son again if he would not condemn his wife's behavior. She was also convinced my family knew of her pregnancy before her because we must have known she cheated and deceptively got her to marry brother-in-law to hide the fact. 
they again had enough and this went on till she gave birth. Sis and brother-in-law went low contact with mother-in-law for months pre and postpartum. Around the time the baby was five months old, mother-in-law apologized and stated she wanted access to her baby again. Sis and brother-in-law were very skeptical, but they agreed for supervised visits only and only if mother-in-law was constantly accompanied by either sister or brother-in-law. Mother-in-law did not like this. She once again threw a tantrum over how her son was corrupted by his evil wife, and her darling son would never do something like this to his mother. She again brought up paternity and called brother-in-law blind and an idiot for letting some common hussy force him to parent someone else's child. Brother-in-law calmly stated it was either his way or the highway. Mother-in-law chose his way. This is the peak of the Entitled Saga, Mother-in-Law Tries Kidnapping the Baby. So one of the days when Mother-in-Law was allowed to visit the baby, she absolutely is no help and demands to be catered to, Sis was very tired. The baby had colic that week and she was run to the ground. Brother-in-law could not be home and Sis tried rescheduling, but Mother-in-Law was already on the way and it was nearly impossible to stop her. My sister says she had just handed the baby over to mother-in-law in the living room and sat on the couch. Big mistake. She has no idea when she dozed off, but sis must have dozed off for a little while after being up with a fussy child and being exhausted and dealing with postpartum issues. When she came to, neither mother-in-law nor the baby was to be found. She looked for the baby frantically and called her mother-in-law, but no answer. She got in touch with brother-in-law who drove home, picked her up, and they went to mother-in-law's house to look for her. Father-in-law answered and said he had not seen mother-in-law since she drove down to visit my sister, but her phone was on Find My Phone, and they could track her phone from his device as they shared the same cloud. Sure enough, within minutes, they see the phone moving towards a local hospital and lab area. It is a one-way road and a dead end. They hop in a car and drive to the hospital. Sis finds mother-in-law arguing with the hospital staff for not performing any medical procedures and tests on the baby without the parents. Mother-in-law wants to get a paternity test performed on the baby. She was detained by the hospital security and the baby was in the custody of the hospital who thought that she had kidnapped the baby. Sis and brother-in-law reached just in time for the hospital to be calling the cops and trying to locate them. They had to show 10 different types of proof of identity and parentage to the staff before they were allowed to take their baby again. Brother-in-law threatened legal action against mother-in-law, not sure what came of that. This happened years ago and mother-in-law and brother-in-law and my sister have the most strained relationship. Baby barely knows their grandma, but is quite close to grandpa who visits often. Well, OP, I don't know why you're calling this trying to kidnap the baby because they removed the baby from your house without your knowledge. That is definitely kidnapping. There should have been charges filed here and a definite no contact order. I'm not sure how you can even think about your mother-in-law after that happened. Our next story today comes to us from Amma Burmad. Entitled parents think highly of their son got proven wrong. Let's jump right in. Hi, I'm a teacher, and I have a lot of entitled parent stories I would like to share, and here's one of them. This was about over a year ago, before the pandemic. I'm a math and science teacher for senior high school students. We teach in a curriculum where students can choose their career paths in high school, and my school is in a more of a rural area, but a big one, about 2.5 to 3,000 students. I have this class for agriculture majors and had two or three troublemakers from time to time. I have a student who had irregular attendance in my class, I'll call him Liam, not real name. I asked other teachers if the student is attending their class, but most of them have the same situation. But the advisor of the student confirms that Liam is there for the homeroom proceedings every morning. I teach that class in the afternoon. One time I got a hold onto Liam in the break time and asked him to come with me in my office. I called out his behavior and asked him if there are some problems that he is going through so I could assist him. I showed him his records from my class, not everything, some attendance for that week, and some activities he had missed. He stated that he is going home to take care of his younger sister. So I arranged some take-home activities for Liam for him to get caught up with the class. He didn't pass any of these activities. So I gave him a communication letter for his parents to go to school immediately, 
so I could prepare some interventions regarding Liam's issues. There are no responses, and Liam said that his parents are too busy. The semester ended and Liam received a failing grade from me, but only me. The other subject teachers felt pity for Liam's stories and gave him passing marks. The following week, during the parent-teacher meeting, the principal called me to his office. When I went inside, there was parents there and our principal. The principal told me that the parents are Liam's, and they needed explanation about Liam's failing grades. I greeted them, Hi ma'am and sir, I'm Emma Bermad, your son's math and science teacher. I believe you're here to discuss Liam's grades. Our principal is sitting across the office, but is carefully listening. I am translating here. Yeah, I believe you've done some mistakes in grading my son, and you most probably are not computing your student's grades right. He's trying to intimidate me. I'm sorry, sir, but I am most sure that my grading is correct, and I have been very transparent with it and discussing it with my students frequently. I can show you my records if you want. So I went quickly to my office to pick my records and laptop, then came back. So where's my son's records? I can use my connections against your school if you're tampering with my son's records. Showed him Liam's records and attendance that is almost blank and filled with absent remarks. Your son is not attending my class because he said he is attending to your sick daughter at the hospital. What sick daughter? My daughter died almost a year ago. I know you're making this up. My son wouldn't lie like that. He is an honor student since elementary and never had bad grades. I know you're attacking my son personally because he said you have a problem with him. My deepest condolences, sir, for your loss, but I barely know your son. He almost never enters my class, and I tried contacting you through my letters, but you are too busy, your son said. I sent him take-home activities, but did not pass, and keeps on saying that he can't do the activities because of your daughter. My principal barged in and told the parents that I am one of the best teachers in the school. He really did, and I liked it, and that I would never do something like that. I have students who hate my guts because I'm young to be a teacher for them, but that never affected their grades. Hey, I'm not your values teacher, so as long as you're good in my class, I'll give you good grades. I'll take this to court. My son always leaves the house in the morning and comes back in the afternoon after class. Where would he be other than his class? Sir, there's no need to go to court, okay? Please come back here tomorrow with your son. I'll prepare a test. If your son really is attending my class, then I'm sure he'll pass. And if your son gets at least 50% of the score, then I'll change his grades. Liam's parents agreed, but the next day, as I prepared the test for Liam, his parents came to my office and apologized to me for their rudeness. Turns out that Liam is lying to his parents and hoping that his father's status, his father is a politician, would intimidate us into changing his grades. Liam is sneaking out of the school during lunch break to meet his girlfriend that already had two kids. God knows what they're doing. Liam attends my class regularly after this, and I reached out to him, then he shared his stories with me. We became sort of buddies, and he invites me sometimes to hang out. Well, OP, you sound like a pretty cool teacher, and I wish there were more teachers like you in the schools. You're looking out for the children, you want what's best for them, and unfortunately, that's not a normal thing these days. Our next story today comes to us from Azalea underscore... Entitled American tourist parents demand free tickets to the zoo because they knowingly arrived at closing time and accused us of ruining their children's vacation. Let's jump right in. Buckle up folks because this one is going to be a ride. Since this summer, I started working at the most popular zoo in my country in our capital city. A little bit of background information about the zoo. We have this separate museum area that is part of the zoo's company, but not part of the actual zoo itself. And you have to buy separate tickets for that museum visit. It closes at 5 p.m. We also have a planetarium which is inside of the zoo, which you can visit for free. There's a show and movie about the universe every hour that lasts for 30 minutes. The zoo closes at 6 during normal weekdays, and so the final planetarium show starts at 5 p.m., ending at 5.30 p.m., so the visitors will still have 30 minutes left to leave the zoo. So this American family, which consisted of a mother, a father, and two very loud young boys, bought tickets for the zoo and for the museum at 3 p.m. They first wanted to visit the zoo, and we told them that the museum closes at 5, so we recommended they visit the museum first but the boys were screaming that they wanted to see the animals, so they insisted they'd visit the zoo first, and so they did. 
We had also told them about the planetarium shows and how the final one is at 5. Then, at 4.45 p.m., they suddenly rush into the museum and demand to be let in, despite the fact that we don't actually let people into the museum anymore after 4.30. They yelled at the museum staff that they had bought tickets and had a right to be let in, and when the museum staff told them that they should have visited earlier and that they were already closing down, the parents literally told their kids to run into the museum, so they got in and the museum staff had to let the parents in as well. So the museum staff let them in under the pretense that they really had to leave at 5 p.m. Fifteen minutes later, the staff walks up to the family and tells them they're closed now and that they had to leave. They threw a fit and refused to leave. Security had to come in to literally escort them out of the premises, and they were yelling and cursing at the security guy the entire time. I was working the cash register and administration desk at the time, and the couple walked up to the office and angrily demanded that they'd been given free tickets for the museum for the next day because they didn't get their money's worth, because they couldn't see everything of the museum in 15 minutes, even though they knew the museum would close at 5 and they knowingly only went in at 4.45. They threatened to sue us if we didn't give them free tickets. My manager eventually did agree to give them the free tickets for just the museum for the following day. So the family left and we thought that was the end of it. Boy, oh boy, were we wrong. Ten minutes later they come back, angry again because they missed the final show of the planetarium since it was now 5.20. Again, the planetarium and all its shows are free. They didn't pay for that. That is included in the zoo ticket. We told them that and reminded them that we had told them that the final show would be at 5. And still, they threw another tamper tantrum and then demanded that they'd be given free zoo tickets as well for the next day, along with the free museum ticket we had already agreed to give them because they claimed they also didn't get their money's worth because they missed all the planetarium shows, which they knew the final time of. So they knew about the museum closing at 5 and still decided to only arrive at 4.45. They also knew that the final planetarium show would start at 5 and didn't go to any earlier ones either. This was all their own doing, and still they demanded that we give them free tickets for their lack of time management. My manager thankfully didn't put up with their final request and told them that we could not give them free zoo tickets because they missed a free event, especially since they knew about the final showtime. The couple, of course, threw a temper tantrum and cursed at us, threatening to sue us. Good luck doing that in a country where lawsuits like that literally never happen. They demanded to speak to the manager and my team manager dropped the biggest I am the manager that I've ever witnessed. I was just listening to it all behind my cash register with a drop jaw. The children started crying, and the couple accused us of making them cry and ruining their vacation. They literally said, you just ruined the vacation of our children. They also accused us of horrible customer service and that we weren't helping them at all, even though we had literally just given them free tickets to the museum. So we ended up having to call security again to escort the family out of the zoo, and my team manager ended up revoking their free ticket for the museum as well for how incredibly rude they behaved. Good on her, she's an awesome manager. Ah yes, the rest of the world doesn't have that same thing that the USA does, where they sue everybody for every little thing, trying to get rich as quickly as they can. Oh my gosh. Our next story today comes to us from D's Nuts Premium. <laughs> Why wouldn't you donate your eggs to a good Christian woman like me? Let's jump right in. New to Reddit, so excuse me if I get anything wrong, still getting used to the app. I had the crappiest week and of course it had to get even worse. I'm a dermatology resident and around a week ago I was working after hours at a cosmetic skin clinic. We do cosmetic procedures like Botox and such. Entitled parent, 48 female, enters and brings along her husband and teen daughter. One of the nurses approaches her and lets her know that only the one person who came to the appointment is allowed to come in. She demands to bring both of them in with her because she is afraid of needles and she knows the owner of the skin clinic so it should be alright. 
The nurse keeps trying to reason with her, but she dismisses it with a weird hand gesture and enters one of the consultation rooms. The clinic only opens when we have a couple patients booked due to COVID, so we are currently understaffed. My coworker and I look at each other and try to debate on who should go see her since in her booking, she hasn't specified which doctor she previously consulted with. After losing a game of rock, paper, scissors, I dreadfully start getting masked to enter the room. As I enter the room, Entitled Parent and Hubby are in a heated fight on whether or not Entitled Parent's lips are too big and the teenager is texting on her phone. I subtly clear my throat. Entitled Parents finally shut the F up and with her Karen voice says, You're not Dr. So-and-so. I only trust Dr. So-and-so to touch my face. I take a deep breath and say, Mrs. EP, when you book the appointment, you have to mention which doctor you prefer to have, since they only come in if they have patients lined up on that day. She looks at me like, what? After some back and forth of her demanding I call the owner and me letting her know I can reschedule her appointment for a later date with the doctor she prefers to have, she calms down and agrees to let me pump her face with more filler and Botox. We make casual conversation and the teen asks, why did you choose to become a skin doctor? To be honest, the answer is peer pressure and money, but I went ahead and explained that both my parents are doctors and growing up, they'd always push my siblings and I to become doctors too. Then I decided to get a low stress job that gave me freedom outside of work and dermatology seemed to be the best option. She seemed very interested and we kept chatting while her mother closely examines her face to check if she's content, looking like a Walmart Kardashian or not. All of a sudden, the husband starts to ask more questions about my family, where they work, and if any of them were sick, which seemed odd, so I just said no and continued talking to the daughter. Entitled parent and husband start to whisper to each other while casually glancing at me as I wash my hands to get ready with the other procedure she came in for. Entitled mother starts asking very odd and personal questions, which I dismissively answer with a word or two because at this point I feel very uncomfortable. And here it comes. Nothing in my life mentally prepared me for this. Mrs. Entitled Parent says her sister had an ovarian teratoma and had to get it laparoscopically removed. She had always dreamed of having kids and was wondering if I could donate my eggs. I was shocked to say the least because I never imagined that a complete stranger would ask me for something like this. I told her I was sorry for her sister and that there were places where she can review a bunch of egg donors so she can carefully review and decide what kind of egg donor she most likely wanted to use. She reassures me saying that her sister would for sure like me and since I'm from a family of doctors, I have no diseases in my family and have great thick hair, she says as she grabs my hair, so she knows the child will be both smart and healthy. I tell her I am not interested in the offer and that I'm sure she could easily find a donor with even better qualities, but she insisted I take her number and consider donating to a poor Christian woman who loves children as much as she loves God. I take the number so she could stop talking and finally exit the room and the nurses could take over. I immediately throw the number away and try to forget about this strange incident. I get scheduled for a consultation yesterday with a woman called Megan who's not a previous patient of mine but has specifically requested for me, which is odd since I hardly get any specific requests from patients to have me since I'm still a resident. Nevertheless, I go in for the consultation and to my horror, entitled parent and soon to be entitled parent Megan approach me with a high-pitched, Hi Dr. OP, how nice to see you again. And this is when I knew I was going to have a nightmare consultation scheduled that I couldn't run away from. Megan is a 37 year old woman who claims to be a God fearing housewife with a dream to mother a child and that her sister had filled her in on all details and even stalked me on Facebook and found my parents and sisters too. Before she keeps rambling on, I let her know that I have already told Entitled Parent that I am not interested in donating my eggs and ask her what she wanted to get done to her skin. She acts confused and tells me, but you would be doing a good deed by donating an egg to a woman who had ovaries ripped away from her body and reminds me that as a doctor and a Christian myself, as she found out through my dad's Facebook, I should be following the word of God and help her out. 
I have nothing against donating eggs. I think it's honorable to help someone in need to have a kid, but I don't want children. I don't know these women, and I'm not going through the whole procedure of extracting an egg for someone I hardly even know. Also, I don't want a child of mine out there in the world. I don't know, it just doesn't sit right with me. I let her know I have no desire to donate my eggs and suggest her a clinic that handles issues regarding infertility and such and ask her again what she came in for. Entitled Parent and Megan look at me perplexed. They can't believe a woman would not want to spread her legs, go through a painful procedure to extract an egg that is to be donated to a complete stranger. How can you say that? Aren't you a feminist? Aren't you a doctor? Aren't you a Christian? Where are your morals? Miss Megan, I don't personally know you. This is a skin and cosmetic clinic. If you need a consultation for infertility, you should go to a fertility clinic, I say as I start to stand up. Dr. OP, you're not acting like a good Christian woman would, entitled parent says. And I just remind her that this is a place of business, and if she's not interested in a consultation for skin or cosmetic procedures, she can go ahead and leave. Entitled parent starts yelling loudly very unchristian words at me, letting me know that Satan will come for me because I have turned down God's will. I call my male nurse and he talks to her and lets her know she needs to leave the clinic immediately or the police would be called. The entitled parent's sisters leave as they curse me out. Isn't life great sometimes? These people sound absolutely crazy and absolutely desperate and you don't know what measures they're going to go to. OP mentioned in an edit that they were messaging her on Facebook from many different accounts. OP, this is where you get that restraining order started because you don't want these people causing any more trouble in your life. Our next story today comes to us from N64 Throwaway. Uncle stole my N64 for my cousin. Refused to return it till my dad threatened to call the police. Let's jump right in. This happened back in 1999 and a similar story reminded me of it. My uncle was always a piece of work, and not just a blatant thief at times, but a major cheapskate to boot. When I was 13 back in 1999, I got a brand new N64 for my birthday, with some used cartridges of both Mario 64 and Mario Kart to go with it. My cousin, who was a complete at the time brat, was all over it the next time he came to visit. The kid really wasn't so bad, but he'd get violent if he lost at a game or didn't get something he wanted. I was playing my N64 in my room when he asked to come in. I didn't mind and figured I could play against him at Mario Kart. We played the first circuit and I dominated at 100cc, while he came in last each time. By the fourth race at the desert level, he totally lost it, crying that I wouldn't let him win, and then started punching me. The kid was like seven, but he liked to aim for the crotch. He just barely missed hitting me in the junk, so I dragged him out of my room. When I told my uncle what my cousin had done, his response was, so why didn't you just let him win? And I told him, there's no way I could have, because even if I wasn't playing, he never came even close to being anywhere but last. My uncle just sneered and said, no excuses, he's little and you should let him win. So I suggested a compromise of letting my cousin play by himself so he could get in some practice at the game. Everyone agreed and I thought that'd be that. But even when I set it to 50cc, my little cousin couldn't do any better than 6th place on any race. He went ape while playing Toad's Turnpike and threw the controller against the wall. I was mad, but tried to stay patient with him by saying he just needed some more practice. Little cousin said he couldn't practice because he didn't have an N64 at home because his dad won't buy him one. I said I was sorry about that and decided it was time to shut the game off because I didn't want to risk something getting broken. My little cousin went crying to his dad that he wanted an N64, and he just told him that they didn't have the money, yet uncle was buying things like beer, cigarettes, and lottery tickets almost daily. So I figured that was it and they left not long later, but the next time I went back to my room I noticed that my N64 was gone. I immediately called my parents. My dad was furious, and my mom tried to make excuses for her brother because he was a single father. But my dad packed us all into his old station wagon, and we drove to my uncle's house. My dad pounded on my uncle's door until he finally opened it. 
Inside, we could hear little cousin playing my Mario Kart game. My dad demanded they return the games and console immediately. My uncle actually denied having it till we pointed out we could hear it, after which he just slammed the door in our faces. My father pounded on the door again and threatened to call the police if he didn't return the N64, and then yelled that he still had the receipts so police could tell it was mine. That's when the N64 stopped playing and I heard little cousin start screaming. My uncle came out with the N64, the two games, cords, and both controllers in a plastic bag and practically shoved it in my hands, then slammed his door shut again. Little Cousin was still screaming and trying to open the door, but my uncle wouldn't let him out. I checked everything in the car, and one of the controller's joysticks had actually been broken. My parents apologized to me and said that my uncle wouldn't be welcome in our house again for some time. Then, they took me to the local game store and bought a replacement controller for me. It was red, so that was a nice upgrade over the previous gray one. A few months later, my uncle was jailed for trying to steal from a store. Don't remember what he tried to take, but my mother decided to file a petition for custody of my cousin without asking my father. That led to a big argument, but we ended up taking in my little cousin anyway, and over the next year or so, unspoiled him. His father never bothered to come back for him, so he sort of became like my little brother, and now he's a pretty good guy. He's still terrible at Mario Kart though. So the uncle went to jail and the cousin became like a brother, and you can definitely tell that you treat him like a brother because of the last sentence. Love this story, really well written OP. Our next story today comes to us from Mortal Wombe. Entitled Dad Stole My Money. Let's jump right in. This happened about two decades ago and I still remember it as one of the most unfair things that my dad did to me. I have since vowed never to act this way to my own kids. When I was 15, I was struggling with school. I was terrible at math and much preferred to spend my time with girls or playing video games. I had a car, given to me by my grandfather, a 1990s Buick Century, great car, steered like a boat. I also had a habit of sneaking out and or leaving stuff to the last minute. Big procrastination energy, but come on, that's what being a teenager is about. Enjoy your youth, kids. So I was doing really bad in math, and when I got my report card to bring home, I found out I got a C-. Earlier, my parents had told me that I was smart and should never get less than a B, or I'd be in trouble. So I lied. I told my parents I got all Bs or better, my other grades were better, and just never gave them my report card. When the spring semester rolled around, crap got real. There were two math classes at my school, the beginner and advanced classes. My parents learned I was in the beginner class and ended up driving to the school to find out why. Of course, they found out about my fall semester's grade and were pissed. In my house growing up, my mom was the one you didn't want angry. I never felt so bad as I did when she found out I lied to her. She wasn't mad for long, just disappointed. Unfortunately, upsetting my mom just set my dad off. My dad went into that mode where he's just screaming and yelling to the point where spit was flying in my face. He turned purple. It wasn't pretty. He got into that mode where it wasn't about me saying sorry, it was about seeing me be hurt. So when I apologized, that wasn't enough. He wanted me to suffer. So here's what happened. He emptied my bank account everything I'd saved all summer, over $2,000, I'd worked several jobs. He took my car, he smashed my computer, and he personally made sure I didn't have a girl over for the whole spring. If he ever caught me doing anything before my homework was done, he would take another $100 as an IOU, meaning any money I earned would go straight to him. This kept up until the end of spring semester when I got a B in math. If you were to ask me as an adult why I don't lie, I'd tell you honestly, it is 100% more to do with the expression on my mom's face when she was disappointed than anything my dad did to me. When I think about my dad during that time, his smug expression whenever he commented on how I couldn't go on dates because of him or couldn't hang out with my friends, also him, I don't think, hey, lying is bad. I think, 
my dad ruined six months of my life because he's a petty butthole. Okay, so I could understand a grounding, I could understand not having the car for a little while, or maybe not having access to a computer for a little while, but the punishment in this case very much so outweighed the crime. Your dad definitely was a butthole, and I'm glad you were able to get away from him. It's stories like these we need to remember when we're dealing with our own children, because we don't want our children to turn around in 20, 30 years and go, yeah, my parents, they were the biggest buttholes. Our next story today comes to us from Plurked, <laughs> my stepdad's entitled mother. Let's jump right in. Backstory. When I was in kindergarten, I met my best friend. She was being raised by a single dad and her grandparents. Her mom was a drug addict and her dad was actually one of the first men in our state to win custody over the mother. This was the mid 90s and my state was a notorious mother state. They lived with his parents. Now, because she was a timid child, I was one of her only friends. That meant we spent a lot of time together. We even did the stereotypical wish we were sisters jargon and sure enough, all the time we interacted, our parents started to gain an interest with each other. Now, for a bit of brief context, I never met my father. My mom, who has many tales of her own entitlement and narcissistic behaviors, married once when I was a baby, for financial security and so I could have a faux father figure, and got divorced after six years of marriage. My mom and my best friend's dad, who I will refer to as my stepdad from now on, didn't actually start dating until the day her divorce was final. Now, as I said earlier, we interacted a lot. She'd spend time at my house, I'd go to her house. Stepdad worked a lot, so it was usually her grandparents, specifically her grandma, who would keep an eye on us. Before our parents started to date, her grandma, who we'll call FSB for Frosty the Snowbee, which I shall explain the nickname later, was usually pretty cordial. I'm not the most outgoing person either, and adults intimidated me, but she hadn't done anything mean, yet. When our parents started dating, we'd spend a whole lot of time together as a family. My mom didn't speak to her mom, and my grandpa was dead, so eventually, my mom wanted to get to know his parents on a more familiar level. So, they decided to go out for dinner one night. Now, I wasn't there for this, my older stepsister from my mom's first marriage was babysitting both us kids. But knowing what I know about Frosty the Snow Bee, I don't doubt its validity. In spite of my mother's knack for embellishment, the first thing Frosty the Snow Bee said to my mom when they sat down was, So, are you going to get divorced yet or what? In the most indignant tone you can imagine. My mom was flabbergasted. She didn't know how to respond at first because she was so taken aback. She and stepdad insisted that her divorce was finalized on her birthday, which was maybe weeks prior, which didn't quell Frosty the Snowbee's existing animosity towards my mom. She basically spent the whole night treating my mom like dirt, making snide comments, while her husband and son ate in silence. On the drive home, my mom regarded his silence and even went as far as to say, I see where you don't get it from. Surprisingly, he understood and took offense. Basically, my mom was saying he didn't understand what a B-word his mom was, and she was upset he didn't back her up or defend her. But, as I've learned from many a Reddit story, a lot of toxic mother-son relationships are like that. Weeks later, we went to their house for a family dinner, where, long story short, Frosty the Snowbee tried to poison my mom with one of her allergens, and accused me of having an eating disorder because I refused to eat her nasty, bland, stereotypical, white people don't use seasoning, bull poop, and accused my mom of being bulimic because she was trying to get the allergen out of her system. I stood up to her and ended up getting into trouble. I was probably eight at this point. Now, because both of our parents worked first shift, we had to spend summers at Frosty the Snowbee's house until we reached fifth grade. During those summers, we'd explore the neighborhood, hang out with other kids, practically avoid being there at all costs because all Frosty the Snow Bee would do is run her mouth and say horrible, hurtful things I'd never entertain saying to someone I actually loathe. I'd also have to try to heat up canned ravioli when she wasn't around so I could eat. She would starve me since I wouldn't eat her food. It would piss her off more when her husband, we'll call him Jim, would make eggs and bacon for me and I'd eat them with no complaint. But he did bring out salt and pepper for me too, he wasn't a super nice dude, but he was a saint compared to that monster. Family holidays were awful too, but those deserve their own post. 
we finally moved into a house together the summer before fifth grade, on the same side of town, and for my mom and me, it was a way safer neighborhood than where we lived. That being said, our parents trusted two 10-year-olds to fend for themselves. I have a 10-year-old now, and I wouldn't ever leave her home alone. But I won't deny, my sister and I were pretty mature, as long as we didn't get into a stupid fight about something. Apparently, Frosty the Snow Bee didn't agree with that. Out of emergency, our parents gave Jim and Frosty the Snow Bee a spare key to the house. We were at home, enjoying our new house, probably playing, doing whatever 10-year-old girls do, when we hear someone walk into our house. Now, we were petrified, because who would be here at this time? So we run out to the living room, and there's Frosty the Snow Bee, smirking at us, saying, Oh, you girls must be up to no good if we scared you that bad. We looked at each other, confused. I asked, Do our parents know you're here? She snaps at me. I don't need their permission, especially from your whore of a mother. My jaw hit the floor. I didn't know what to say. I couldn't say anything. I was shocked. She then turned on her own granddaughter and started saying some stuff about her mother, a woman who hadn't been present for years at this point, the whole time with an evil grin. Again, we were both in shock. She then marched us to our rooms and instructed us to start throwing stuff away we didn't need. Now, my mom and I left a lot of stuff behind at our old house because our landlord was a slumlord who did a bunch of illegal stuff and basically locked us out before we could get out the rest of our stuff. My mom also made me give my dog to my stepbrother, previous marriage, and he ended up letting her run away. Never saw her again. That being said, I just changed my whole life and gave up so much at 10, and I wasn't going to allow this woman to make me get rid of the stuff I had left. I started to talk back, and she exploded on me. What she said still makes me sick. You know what? You're nothing. Your mother is my son's servant, slave, and whore. And you're nothing more than a little whore. You'll be lucky to live in the basement and eat scraps. She then again turned on my sister. And you? You think you're pretty? You're not pretty. You're ugly. And you're just like your drug whore of a mother. I started bawling and I ran out of the room grabbed a cordless phone from my parents' room, and locked myself in the bathroom. I dialed my mom's work phone and told her what was happening. As I did that, Jim started pounding on the door telling me to get out. As I said, he was a saint compared to Frosty the Snow Bee, not here. He was standing there letting her say whatever the hell she wanted, and when I reacted, he got mad. Now, when I got a hold of my mom, I could only give her a very short version of the events taking place. All I said was, Frosty the Snow Bee and Jim showed up, and that's all she needed. I was off the phone in 10 seconds, and I knew, without her saying anything, that she was about to be on her way home. Sadly, she worked 40 minutes away. When I got off the phone, I opened the door, smiled at Jim through tears, and told him I called my mom. The look of horror on his face was priceless as he turned back down the hallway to my room where I could still hear Frosty the Snow Bee going on a verbal tirade against her own baby's baby. Jim told her, Aaron is on her way. Let me tell you, it got real quite really fast. And they left. When my mom got home, she was furious. She saw what Frosty the Snow Bee was making us do and I guess while we were being screamed at, Jim was going through our parents' room. She drove over there immediately and demanded an explanation. I'm not even kidding when I tell you that Frosty the Snow Bee flat out lied and said I was blowing everything out of proportion. I don't know what my mom said, but Frosty the Snow Bee never said another horrible thing to us again, nor did she come over while we were home alone. However, this doesn't end here, oh no. When we went back to school, she'd come over and rearrange the kitchen. My mom would come home super pissed off, and she'd call them, but they'd refuse to answer. She told stepdad to finally do something about his grunt mother. He basically said his hands were tied, until my mom had a brilliant idea. She finally remembered that, being that Frosty the Snow Bee and Jim are old, their son has a spare key, which means she has a spare key. She went and made a copy of that spare key and told stepdad that either he can call his mother and tell her point blank to stop effing with our stuff, or my mom will come rearrange her entire house. Stepdad was scared and finally told his mom to cut it out and probably told her of my mother's threats because that also made her stop coming over. 
present day. Stepdad and sister don't talk. He accused her of stealing, though I'm convinced it was his parents. He's retired now, has an amazing pension, and they've been retired since before I was born. So they have literally nothing. Jim and Frosty the Snowbee expect stepdad to financially take care of them. Whereas, yeah, he paid for my sister's school, helped her financially and such, but she never freaking asked for or expected it. I think stepdad was being fed some crap from Frosty the Snowbee to turn him on his child so he could spend the money he was using to help her future to make their last years comfortable. But this is speculation. I don't know all the claims. I'm not technically invested in any of the drama, since stepdad and my mom broke up months before she died, but I have one final tale of Frosty the Snowbee. My stepdad invited me and my youngest out for dinner, since my eldest was with her dad, and I wasn't aware that his parents were going to be there. Now, we do have another older sister, whom I'm semi-close to now, because we have kids. Her kids are basically teens now, and are terrified of Frosty the Snowbee and Jim. Frosty the Snowbee has shown her same kindness to her great-grandchildren. Ironically, she loved my eldest, I don't understand it. Apparently, they'd bring her over there, and Frosty the Snowbee would show a side none of us have ever seen before. So, I show up last, and sure enough, the only seats left are right next to Frosty the Snowbee. Reader, I purposefully turned my back on her the entire time, spoke to my nieces and nephew, would look over at her to talk to my stepdad, reached over her for salt. If she tried to talk to my kid, I'd draw attention away from her. Real, blatantly petty stuff. I don't normally act like this, but darn it, my mom's dead. I have no real parent left, except the mock family our parents tried to create, and I have no patience left for horrible human beings. You couldn't be respectful to me the entire time you've known me, and since my mama's not here to check me, I don't have to act any sort of way. So, I let her know by my actions that she is the one who is really nothing. Karma is a bitch, isn't it? Well, OP, you did nothing to deserve all of that drama. So, here's something that you should do when you're meeting somebody and deciding who you want to be with for the rest of your life. Take a very close look at the people that will become your in-laws because the person you're with might turn out to be just like them. And even if they don't turn out to be like their parents, remember, you're gonna have to put up with those people for a very long time. <laughs> Our next story today comes to us from RCR Moon. No, I will not watch your rude child. Let's jump right in. My son rides the bus with a very entitled, unruly girl that lies about everything and bullies people. The bus driver has my son where he can see him to prevent it on the bus. Her mother is just as bad. We do live in a rural area, so the bus stops are spread out. Entitled girl lives just far enough off, her mom drives her. On with the nonsense. We are down at the bus stop in my car because it's raining. Normally we walk, but who wants to go to school soaked? Passing time by playing I Spy and games on my phone, here comes Entitled Mother. She spots my car, Entitled Girl gets out and beelines to my car. Doors are locked. She runs back to Entitled Mother's car and loudly complains she can't get in. No, I am not letting her in either. Did it once, she trashed my car, was rude, never again. So, you need to let my daughter in? No, I don't. Some people have things to do and can't sit around all day. Some people have jobs, but still make sure their kids get on the bus. Go away. She tried to reach through the cracked window. Open this door right now. Entitled girl wants to sit in your car. I need my nails done. I can't wait here. Nope, not my kid, not my problem. Just get in your car. It's raining. At this point, I started closing the window and she jerked her hand back. She did not get in her car, but she decided to start hitting mine screaming about her self-importance and me needing to understand her daughter is always right. No, I did not call the police. No need. The third kid at our stop is a sheriff's officer's son. We have a deal. I watch his son in the morning. He gets mine home safe in the afternoon. He pulls up to entitled mother beating my car, entitled girl screaming she is going to die of embarrassment now that people see her mother's car. Entitled mother, why are you beating on OP's car? It's raining. Go sit in yours. I unlock the doors for his son to get in. You see that? She won't let entitled girl in, but yet your son didn't even ask and she let him go in. She's disrespectful of important people's time. 
You are responsible for your child, not OP. She can decline access to her vehicle if she wants to. Get in your car, or I'm going to call my sergeant to authorize an impound, because you will go to jail for attempted destruction of OP's car and harassment. Entitled mother sulked back to her car, and the bus pulled up. Took my big umbrella out, got the boys on the bus. Entitled mother drove off before the bus closed the stop sign, so the officer stopped her for that violation. I went home chuckling. This goes back to a comment I've made on previous Entitled Parents posts, where there should be some kind of a test for a person to be a parent. Because if going to get your nails done is more important than getting your kid to school properly and trying to save them from a little bit of rain, then you shouldn't be a parent. Our next story today comes to us from the Unreal Dawn Steel. Entitled mother lets her son destroy 100-year-old antique table. Let's jump right in. Apologies if this sounds like a tangent, it happened last night and I'm still fuming. I, 24 female, previously posted in r slash child free about one of my mother's younger friends, an entitled mother, early 40s female, who I first knew as carefree and wonderful until she had her first kid. That child ended up being a complete brat, with her mother's encouragement, but entitled mother had another child, a son, for male, who I kind of liked because he wasn't as intense as his older sibling. As of last night, that has changed. For context, my mother's greatest joy in life, other than her kids, is antiquing. She dresses every room in her house very carefully, and will stop at every vintage shop around to find a piece of furniture, sometimes using road trips to find new antique stores, and examine what is inside. I used to hate going with my mom to these stores, but since she took all three of us kids and told us that these used to belong to other people, I think it gave us an early respect for other people's things. We were never the kids to break stuff or jump on furniture, in our homes or anyone else's, and I'm pretty sure that contributed to it. When she was pregnant with my oldest sibling in 1990, mom found a small circular wooden table with three curved legs topped with a circle of marble. The shop proprietor told her it was 70 years old, so she bought it for a song, shined it up and stuck it in her living room, where it immediately became a staple of our house. The coffee table lasted her through three kids' college graduations, a move in 2000, and countless family parties and events. Still shiny and looking new and gorgeous. It's as much a part of the family now as any of us kids. Now to last night, Entitled Mother's birthday recently occurred, so since she had given Mom a birthday celebration last month, Mom decides to return the favor, inviting Entitled Mother, her husband, and their kids to our house for lobster. Already, I'm not a fan of this. Whenever Entitled Mother and her kids come over, my mom makes a serious effort to give the kids something fun to do while the adults talk. We have a collection of coloring books, blocks, dolls, Legos, puzzles, action figures, and a TV in the basement from when my siblings and I were growing up. And mom even bought them some new toys herself, but inevitably the kids will play down there for two minutes and then come to their mom to complain that they're bored, then proceed to wreak havoc on our house. My parents, who Entitled Mother sees as her kid's aunt and uncle, have warned the kids many times not to jump on things, but they do not listen. The oldest kid is also very combative and likes to pull hair and hit people, as I learned firsthand, and broke a holiday decoration given to my dad by his late mother. Of course, Entitled Mother coddles her kids and coos that they're the best in the world and all that BS. I've told my mom repeatedly that I don't want to be around the kids or their parents, but she brushes it off. In fact, she likes to tease me for not interacting with Entitled Mother and not coming downstairs when Entitled Mother visits and says that Entitled Mother shouldn't get in the way of me living my life. I live with my folks and am invited to attend the party but make my usual choice of opting out. Since I've just finished the first week of a new job, I intend to celebrate with a day at the bookstore and a night with friends. But yesterday morning, as I was preparing to leave, Mom asked why I was going to leave her to deal with the two kids by herself. I told her that I wasn't going to let them get in the way of living my life. She laughed and wished me a good day, and I left. My day was wonderful. I spent the morning and early afternoon at my favorite bookstore, the evening with my friends at a wine bar, and the night with them at a karaoke room. I came home around 11.30 that night and enter from a door in our sunroom, 
where my parents are asleep on the couch watching TV. I wake them up, tell them about my day, and they seem genuinely happy it went so well. To be polite, I ask how the party went. My folks get quiet and look at each other, and my mother sounding very drained tells me to go into the living room the next room over. Confused, I look through the doorway and immediately see why. The beautiful table, now a century old, is broken. Its three curved wooden legs were bisected and splintered. There's a small crack in the marble top, and a collection of wood shards litter the carpet. What happened, I asked. Earlier that day, around 6.30 p.m., my dad and entitled mother's husband went to pick up my grandpa, plus a steamer for the lobster. While they were away, mom had worked to settle the kids in the basement and reminded them not to jump on anything, then gone to the living room to converse with entitled mother. As they are talking, my mother leaves to go to the restroom at the other end of the house. She stops in the kitchen before returning and hears a crash in the living room. Mom runs in, and lo and behold, son had become bored, comes upstairs to the living room, and started jumping on furniture, including the ancient table, while Entitled Mother watched. My mother is predictably horrified and stares as Entitled Mother examines son for injuries and reassures mom that the kid is fine. Mom gets sick to her stomach, takes son aside, and tells him in a serious but not yelling voice that Auntie is very disappointed in him and that he knows the rules at her house. Entitled Mother overhears and berates Mom, telling her that she is the only one who can speak that way to her kids, before coddling son and telling him that he's going to be okay. Mom then outright asks Entitled Mother if she herself told the kids not to jump on furniture at our house. Entitled Mother replies casually, No, I didn't tell them not to. The husband returns and all three men are shocked. Entitled Mother's husband immediately offers to pay a carpenter to fix the table, which my mother accepts. Dinner goes on, but it is cold and impersonal between Mom and Entitled Mother. This morning, Entitled Mother's son and the husband came by our house to give Mom a bouquet of flowers, an apology, and the number of a carpenter who they'll pay for. She puts on a smile and says thank you, but is very upset nonetheless. My dad doesn't want the kid in our house until he's older. Mom says she'll be keeping her distance from Entitled Mother for the time being, since she can't teach her kids to respect other people's property or discipline them properly. My heart breaks for my mom. I don't plan on having kids, but if you do, please teach them at an early age to respect other people and their things. I read a bunch of the comments down below this one, and the general consensus is that you don't need a carpenter because carpenters generally build houses. What you need is a furniture repair person, someone who specializes in older furniture, who knows the ways to repair that without using modern machinery. Definitely don't use the one that they suggested. Find one that you know can do the work properly, and then send them a bill. And if they don't pay it, take them to small claims court. Our next story today comes to us from Cal and Amelia. Entitled parent gets pew pew drawn on her because she can't accept that times have changed. Let's jump right in. I want to state clearly that this did not happen to me, but to a friend in a state that has adopted a set of stand your ground laws. I know this will probably be buried in new or get removed, but I just wanted to share something that happened today that really makes you appreciate the term trigger discipline. I won't bother with the cast as it should be fairly obvious what type of people are involved, judging by the title. A friend of mine was out and about with his girlfriend shopping for groceries, clothes, and some new utensils. My friend and his girlfriend stop at the store to pick up some clothes, some for themselves and some for his girlfriend's niece, who is all but two years old and is having her birthday in two days. After finding the clothes that both him and his girlfriend want for themselves and his girlfriend's niece, they were walking up to the checkout when, according to my friend, they heard a woman screech, You filthy harlot! You can't wear those kinds of clothes in public! This made them both stop and turn around to see an obese, middle-aged woman with the stereotypical Karen haircut that was dragging along a poor kid who looked like he was wearing hand-me-downs from several generations before. While the mother was wearing what appeared to be a fancy dress that looked horrible on her, according to my friend, jewelry, and had enough makeup on her face to put a Barbie doll that's been dunked in wax to shame. My friend didn't like that this woman called his girlfriend a harlot, 
The term harlot was common for many, many years ago and was used to describe women and basically calling them whores or prostitutes in a religious manner or context. He simply said, Lady, don't use that word to describe my girlfriend. You shouldn't even be using that sort of language around your kid. Besides, what she decides to wear is her choice. Now kindly leave us alone. The mother screeched, I am a God-fearing, God-worshipping woman and your elder. You have to listen to me. My friend's girlfriend made the mistake of saying that they might have heard her out if she had been nice and calm about it and not yelling like a banshee on crack. This, not surprisingly, didn't sit well with the mother in the slightest, which then caused her to start shouting about how that as their superior, and because they were younger than her and less disciplined than her, that they needed to listen to her and that her precious baby didn't deserve to see a trashy woman wearing revealing clothes and that they would taint his mind. This in turn pissed both of them off, but they decided to just drop the subject altogether instead of feeding fuel to the dumpster fire. They walk away after they heard the mother sputtering and yelling about how my friend's girlfriend was a bad influence to her precious child and how they would both, and I quote from his account, be sent to hell one way or another. That last comment put him on edge, and rightfully so. After checking out and with their cheerful moods dampened, they both were on their way to my friend's car when they both heard Sweetie, get in the car. Mommy has some problems to deal with. They both rolled their eyes and continued on their way to my friend's car until they heard, I'll cut those clothes off you myself, you filthy sinners, by the distinctive voice of the mother that they hoped they had seen the last of. My friend turns around and saw the woman hobbling over with a knife in her hand with the blade flipped out, yelling at them the whole time. My friend immediately tells his girlfriend to call the police as he yells at her to stop walking towards them with the knife. When she doesn't stop, he once again yells at her to stop and please put away the knife and that nobody has to get hurt. When she still doesn't walk away, my friend drew his concealed carry out from his waistband and once more shouts at the woman to just walk away and that he doesn't want to use his pew pew. He borderline begged her not to make him have to pull the trigger, that he didn't want her kid to lose his mother. The mother screeched that she would get him arrested for drawing a dangerous weapon on a law-abiding person that was doing God's work and quickly hobbled away, much to his relief. His girlfriend came out from behind a nearby car and handed the phone to him so he could explain what happened. He let the operator know that he was a lawful concealed carrier and that he had just drew his weapon on a person that had wished him and his girlfriend bodily harm. Following the operator's instructions, he described the time, place, and the vehicles that were around him and set his firearm on the trunk of his car and both him and his girlfriend stepped away from the trunk of his car. When the police arrived, they detained my friend. Detained does not mean arrest. He was just put in the back of the cruiser while the police sorted things out. No handcuffs were involved and no rights were read, and they both gave the responding officers their side of the story and pointed out the security cameras outside. They confiscated my friend's pew pew, a standard procedure for incidents like these, and asked them both to give a statement at the police station. They agreed and my friend was even complimented later by an officer for not being hasty and showing exceptional trigger discipline. He has not gotten his pew pew back and most likely will not receive it back until this whole case is sorted out. But he then told me that losing his pew pew for the time being is preferred over having to potentially hurt someone over something as stupid as clothing. I'll let you fine folks know any updates that might happen if my friend is willing to talk about it. Thanks for hearing me out if you read through this entire event. I just really thought that this was a shining example of what problems can happen when entitlement and what is probably mental health issues mix. I agree there had to be some kind of mental health issue going on there with Karen. That's just not a normal way that people react to a situation and I hope she's able to get the help she needs to move forward in life. OP, I'm glad to hear that your friends got out of it okay and I'm sure they'll get their pew pew back soon. Our next story today comes to us from Possible Phil 40. Entitled parent wouldn't accept a solution and gets banned from water park forever. Let's jump right in. This happened a couple of years ago, but it still makes me shake my head. I, 19 female, had a job working at a water park dispatching rides. Some of the rides require the guests to get a tube at the bottom of the ride and carry it up to the top. 
Water park employees know that only certain tubes can be used on certain rides. If you use the wrong tube on the wrong ride, you are asking for people to be injured. The ride I was working had water jets that exploded from the bottom of the ride, so the tubes had to be very durable. Anyway, Entitled Mom and Entitled Kids are waiting in line. I can see that they have grabbed the wrong set of tubes from the bottom of the ride. They have clear tubes, which are not nearly durable enough for this ride, when they needed reinforced blue tubes. I go over to Mom and explain that she has the wrong tube for this slide. One of the correct tubes is pasted next to the entrance to the ride, so it's pretty clear which tube goes with which ride. I tell her that when she gets to the front of the line, she will need to step to the side, and I can have a worker run down and grab some correct tubes for them. She can still go on the ride, someone just needs to bring her the right tubes. Entitled Mother doesn't acknowledge me at all. Anyway, she gets to the front of the line and tries to sit in her tube to go down the ride. Ma'am, I'm sorry, this isn't the correct tube. I've radioed to have someone bring the correct tube up for you and your party, but I can't let you ride down in this tube. It's not safe and you can get hurt. Please stand to the side until your tube gets here. I waited in line. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going down the ride. Get the F out of my way. You can't go down the ride on this tube. It's not safe. Get the F out of my way, you B. Then the crazy part. She throws the tube at my face. It's bulky and not heavy, so I can easily dodge it, but now I have to call security too. My manager is the person who was trekking the tubes up, and upon hearing my call for security, he drops the tubes and comes sprinting to me. Entitled Mother is now destroying the landscaping around the top of the ride and is encouraging her kids to join in. How dare this B make us wait? This C won't let you on the ride. I'm 19, I'm not paid to put myself in harm's way, so I do nothing to stop her or her kids. She is literally pulling out grass and spitting in my general direction. I picked up the tube she threw and I'm sitting on it on the side of the ride. Entitled kids of course join in and are spitting in my general direction and ripping up dirt and plants. I'm 10 feet away so no spit got anywhere near me. And that's how Entitled Mother and her Entitled Kids got banned from the park forever. The tube she needed, which manager was carrying up, were 10 stairs away from her. It was around a curve, so she couldn't see them. It's interesting how in a lot of these Entitled Parent stories, it's like a switch is flipped and the person becomes entitled to the nth degree. What's even more interesting though, is that there doesn't seem to be an off switch. Huh. I thank you for watching, hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.